Good evening and welcome, welcome everybody. Wow, what a turnout. This is amazing. Uh, I am Elena Kreef, Professor in Women's and Gender Studies. I want to welcome all of you, our special guests here for tonight's uh, wonderful and unique and very special evening. Uh, I want to thank also those of you who drove in from the greater Boston area, Chelmsford, Jamaica Plain, uh, students, colleagues, staff, my fellow Genki sisters uh, and friends. Uh, so thank you all for coming. Um, before we get started too, let me just uh, thank all of those on campus who've made this uh, ambitious event tonight possible. Uh, Women's and Gender Studies and American Studies are the official co-hosts of this event and also the Wilson Fund. Our many, many co-sponsors include the History and Religion Departments and Environmental Studies and Peace and Justice uh, Studies programs. Also, special shout out to Betty Tiro, without whom I don't know what I would do. Um, she is my, uh, my troubleshooter extraordinaire. Um, let me just say that back in June of this year, when, uh, I, when I, I met with Orville to talk about a visit to Wellesley College, uh, and the, the proposed title at that time was Prophecies, World Peace, and Global Healing, The Return of the White Buffalo, I had no idea in June, although I suspect maybe he had an idea that very soon afterwards he would become uh, very involved with what is now becoming the largest international movement in Cannonball, North Dakota. You may have heard of a peaceful protest that's being held right now against the Dakota oil pipeline. Uh, there have been up to 4,000 people at the peace camps there, and right now I've been told there are over 300 tribes who are represented. Orville says this is the largest gathering of Native people in something like 150 years. So talk about prophecy, uh, and we'll talk about this this evening as well. Uh, I also want to give a very special welcome before we get started to Paula Horn, Orville's wife, who traveled out here as well with him. Uh, and I'll invite uh, Paula also during our, our uh, Q&A discussion afterwards if she wants to participate or anyone has any questions, we can also um, uh, include you in our, in our conversation. So anyway, um, I'm so thrilled and honored that Chief Orville Looking Horse uh, has finally uh, uh, been able to come visit us at Wellesley College. Uh, for those of you who may not know uh, a lot about Orville's background, uh, let me give you um, just a brief, a brief summary. Uh, he comes from the Cheyenne River Reservation in South Dakota. Uh, he is the 19th keeper of the sacred white buffalo calf pipe and bundle, and also the spiritual leader of the Lakota Nation, which includes the Lakota, the Dakota, and the Nakota people. His prayers have opened numerous se sessions of the United Nations, presidential inaugurations, and his many awards include the Juliet Hollister Award from the Temple of Understanding, a non-governmental organization with consultation status with the UN Economic and Social Council. He is the founder of World Peace and Prayer Day, and he has, been, uh, he has long been a global spokesperson for the environment. In addition, Orville has also been the spiritual advisor and is one of the original founding writers of the annual Chief Bigfoot Memorial Ride that covers some 300 miles on horseback in weather that you cannot even imagine. One, one infamous year it was 80 degrees below zero with wind chill. Uh, whether it's blizzarding or um, iced out, uh, uh, the men, women, and children undertake that 300 mile ride that starts in Standing Rock Reservation, tracing the trail of Chief Bigfoot and his band where they traveled uh, fleeing for their lives until they reached that infamous place on the map, uh, Wounded Knee on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. Uh, and if you know your history, you know uh, about the massacre on December 29th, 1890, an event that Black Elk would later say broke the sacred hoop. 100 years later, a medicine man had a vision that one of the ways to, to heal that sacred hoop would be to retrace the steps of Bigfoot uh, and his band and um, arrive, at the de arrive at Wounded Knee uh, where a healing ceremony took place. Um, it's been said that it would take seven generations for the broken um, hoop to heal. 
Uh, we'll hear tonight about what's going on in Cannonball, North Dakota, and we'll also learn about uh, the white buffalo calf woman and uh, what the arrival of the white buffaloes since the early 1990s means. Uh, so please join me in giving a very warm Wellesley welcome to Chief Orville Looking Horse. Mutakepi apetukle chante washte na pet chuzapi. Blessings and greetings, my relatives. Well, then, okay, oh, Hina Jipinka, Heche, Maka Akan Heche, Lena, Watakuhe, Wongla Kapi, Nache, Tuai, the Tat Hokatekia, Zanya Kimonipiti. It's a great honor to be here, my relatives. I am very uh, honored that uh, each and every one of you are here. I speak my language first because this is who, we, who I am, who we are. No matter where we go in the whole world, we always uh, introduce ourselves with our language. And uh, because that, uh, I'll tell you some of our traditional ways is that we uh, work with spirit, we do ceremonies, we have to acknowledge the spirit first before before us. We're uh, human beings, we're people of the earth, uh, it's a way of life, so uh, I come from, right now, a place called Cheyenne River Reser Reservation in South Dakota. And if you go about 65 to 70 miles an hour for, you know, it takes a, that go one hour, two hours to go across the reservation. And they say that uh, the Great Sioux Nation is the uh, second largest. But if you include our people in Canada, we're the, <coughs> excuse me, we're the largest. Because, uh, well, a peace treaty with the, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we have the peace treaty with the U.S. government, and uh, back in uh, 1851 and 1868. So we never became uh, U.S. citizens until 1924, and. When I was born, my grandmother, you know, she was uh, a sacred bundle keeper. And my grandmother was, uh, no, she raised me and my older brother. In our traditional ways, like the, of a child is being raised by the Tiwahe, the family, the community. Because a child being raised, like a, a father and mother cannot correct that child. It's the responsibility of the uncles and aunties. So we were raised by uh, our grandmothers and like Paula was uh, raised by her grandmother. So in our, in our ways, uh, you know, we have that uh, family um, 
unit where uh, we don't, uh, for me, I never seen a, a drunk person, but uh, of course, uh, when I when I was born, before that, you no, know, our people could not drink uh, alcohol until um, in the early fifties. Uh, there's a law that passed that. Um, an uh, Indian person cannot drink whiskey <laughs> on the reservation. But before that, uh, when treaties were signed, you know, they got them drunk and signed that treaty. So there was a lot of, uh, like, uh, we really don't, don't know that like, uh, all the things that has gone wrong during the treaty signing, but treaty is a treaty. And uh, I was in the last stages of the boarding school. But it, I heard that you know, this is a old you know, women's college and The bundle, the, the chanupa that I take care of was brought by a woman. And I was told that no, to respect uh, the women. There's an equal, equal respect between uh, a man and a woman in our tradition. So a lot of our traditions, the culture, you know, it's a balance that we always maintain through our ceremonial ways that uh, there's a man and a woman. So a lot of our teachings uh, goes back to uh, the, the way that Tipi was set up. And 1966, uh, my grandmother, you know, she was, she caught pneumonia and double pneumonia. She was in the hospital in, in our hometown. So the doctors, uh, she said, told the doctors, said, um, I want to go home. I want to go home to uh, my uh, place so I can uh, get my own medicine, my traditional medicine. But the doctor said, no, you can't do that. And then uh, that's all. Well, before uh, she made that journey, the sacred journey into the spirit world, all the relatives in, in our way, they come and see us, they talk to us. So they, 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 were, uh, they were around her. And she told my, our Tawai, the families, and said, uh, my grandchild here will be the next sacred bundle keeper called Chanupa Awanka, the keeper of the sacred pipe. And my grandmother, she told the family that um, if the people don't straighten up, then uh, he shall be the last sacred white bundle calf bundle keeper. So, all my life, you know, that's, I've always thought about that, what that meant. We were living in log cabins, but beside our log cabin was a teepee. And they told me about uh, why that our children has to be born not teepee. Because long ago, you know, the, the way our creation story started was Ea. Ea was a first spirit. It was a red stone 
the keeper of the fire. And the, the second spirit was Maniwichwani, the water of life. When these two came together, brought walk, brought a sacred energy. And that's where the sound came from. And as time went on, we have our stories, the stories of long ago. So it was told among the people that it has to be told in a spiritual way. All of our, because it's all, all about spirit. We have to ask spirit that we have to uh, now who can share this. So up to this day, now we, when we try to, when we want to uh, talk about the water, we have to ask the spirit water, is it okay? We're gonna, I pray that now. I would say good things, you know. And I pray about the earth. I'll tell you, the earth is a spirit that I, sh I want to share good things. So that's the way we were taught. So I became the next uh, sacred bundle keeper 19 generations ago. The, this bundle was brought by a spirit woman. Every Bundle keeper lived to be 100, over 100 years because our prayer with that food, our medicine, the first water, the Maniwichoni. And the way that uh, we're told is that, you no, know, we came from the Wichakpi Oyati, the star nation, the star knowledge. Every star up there has its uh, teaching. It's a vortex to the Great Spirit, this teepee. And a child being born in that teepee. So this is a, a place in the center was uh, this child to be born. The mother and the father has to be there. When a child is born, now, the mother giving birth, they choose a midwife with a good mind. Because we have to always honor that, that spirit. Always rem remind ourselves that the sacred knowledge has to be kept high, that high. The honor is uh, like the, in our tradition is a wiyaka. It's a feather. So when we go speak, now we we have to earn that right to speak. We have to earn that right to wear this headdress. But the last over hundred years ago, you now this headdress is called a war bonnet. And it's not a war bonnet. It's a spiritual headdress. That now you have that right to speak about that spirit. In our way, you know, when somebody goes out to speak among the council, if they don't have that headdress, then they give them a, a feather. So they can't lie. Because when you speak, you're speaking to Wakantanka, the great spirit, and you're speaking, you're sharing your feelings. But it has to uh, be, uh, come, when you stand up, you're honoring, honoring that uh, sacred knowledge. So every morning, when you get up in the morning, you get up with a good mind, because you're honoring that red day, that Ampetu Luta, the sun is a life giver provides, give us life. Without that sun, there'll be no life. Uchimaka is a spirit mother, grandmother. She's a provider. So 
in the recent years, and we made that statement with that a world peace and prayer day, that uh, Mother Earth is a source of life, not a resource. Because we know that uh, we are in that time in this world when uh, the old tradition that needs to be uh, respected. Because Mother Earth is sick and has a fever. So I, we were one of the first people that uh, came to United Nations 1990 to deliver a message because we're moving on into a time when uh, all these white animals were to be born. After the creation stories, there's a time when our people were supposed to follow these tr traditional spiritual ways. And, and yet because, because uh, we're human beings, we abused life. So what happened? Uh, the great teaching came about. And there was no food, no, nothing was good. There was a lot of anger, there was a lot of uh, abuse. And at that time, the people were brought down to their knees. And they sent scouts out every day to look for food. Then one day there was two scouts sitting on the top of the hill. And the, and the far, not too far was like a cloud. And from there, a woman was coming. And this woman was coming and she came to these two scouts. Said, I know what you are thinking. One of you have a good mind. And one of you, you don't have a good mind. I said, you know who you are, you come to me. So the one said, I, he was talking and said, I must, she's a beautiful woman. I must take her for my wife, my woman. And uh, the other said, Scott said, yeah, don't do that. No, she must be a spirit woman. Look at her, now she's beautiful, black, buckskin dressed and carrying this bundle. What is that bundle? But the other scout said, he walked to her. The cloud came around, when the clouds lifted, he was a skeleton. And she told the other scout, go back, and tell him what you've seen. The next day she came, she was singing these songs. And up to this day, you know, we hold these songs in our sermons. She brought this bundle and opened that bundle as a red stone <coughs> and a stem. She put it together, and this is how you can pray. You're going to honor the grandfathers to the west, to the north, the east, and the south, and the great spirit and Mother Earth. You're going to pray with this Chanupa. There's seven ceremonies that came with the sacred bundle. And only the good shall see the pipe. The bad should not even see it or touch it. In time, you would know about the cycle of life. In time, you would understand that you're part of everything that is. And she told the people, with this Chanupa, you walk upon the earth in a sacred manner in peace and harmony. Now, live in a good way. So from that time, we were known as the Pteoyate, the Buffalo people, because she said she came from the Buffalo people. Then she walked up the hill, she stopped and rolled over and stood up with a young black buffalo, and she stopped walked up the hill and stopped and rolled over and it was a red one. So the first one is a black, second one is a red one. Then walked up the hill, stopped and <clears throat> rolled over and stood up as a yellow. And then 
the fourth time she stopped and, and rolled over and stood up as a, as a white one. Went over the hill as a white buffalo calf. And she told the people that someday I shall return and stand upon the earth as a white buffalo calf. When that happens, again, people will say, get up in the morning and say nothing is good. There's going to be so much anger. All the bad things that belong, doesn't belong in that ceremony will come about very abusive. Brothers and sisters will be fighting. There's going to be earth changes and climate changes because the spirit is being abused. You're going to see volcanoes. You're going to see earthquakes because the spirit mother mother earth is sick and has a fever. So the story was handed down for 19 generations, every bundle keeper, peep, every sacred bundle keeper lived over 100 years. Tell my grandmother, 1966. And then she told me that no, from this day, no, you'll always walk but uh, honoring the spirit, honoring that er what we hold sacred in our life to share. So the elders, uh, when my grandmother passed on, they did a, did a ceremony, become the eighth ceremony. They said, uh, you're going to walk with the sacred bundle. You can never have a regular job. You're going to, uh, you're not going to carry a gun. So I never went to uh, join military. And she said, you always have to walk and pray for people that are sick. Even people that try to do you harm, you pray for them. So for me, that's the way that I was told at the age of 12 years old. And in our language, there's no fall language. And so for me, you know, they told me I, I could never use fall language, which I never did. I've always walked, tried to walk in a good way every day. I get up, try to get up in the, with a good mind because we are living in, in spirit. 19, uh, that was early, in the 80s when uh, they talked about wounded knee and what happened to Chief Bigfoot. Chief Bigfoot was my great-great-grandfather. And he lived on the Cheyenne River Reservation, hidden towards Wounded Knee, uh, Pine Ridge. And he got massacred. It was all women and children. In that cold December day. 100 years time, they said that uh, it's going to be a time of healing. But I spoke about this time that back in 1890, the tree, tree of life died. And uh, once again, people would uh, come together Crazy Horse is a pretty well-known leader among our people. And Crazy Horse, he talk, talked about, I don't want to sign that treaty because 
the elders talked about that paper, it's all about money. And we're not, uh, our way of life is, it's all about spirit. If we're taking care of our ceremonies, our sacred sites, and the land, the water, it's a way of life. So Crazy Horse uh, spoke about this. And one of his last dreams was that, no, he never cried. But one of his last dreams is that what he saw in the future, it brought tears in his eyes. He said it was not good. And He talked about through uh, bad times and the worst times, but someday all nations would stand under the tree of life. Going back to my grandmother, you no, know, she told me about the home birth and that teepee a child is born. The father takes that afterbirth and lays that afterbirth on the ground. On that afterbirth is a tree. Looks like a tree. Mother Earth, Mujimakha. We come from a, a place called Shasapa the Black Hills of South Dakota, the heart of Mother Earth, where we do ceremonies, the Four Seasons, to maintain this balance of life upon Mother Earth. We, have, uh, we do the Welcoming Thunder Ceremony in March 21st every year. And then we have the ceremony on June 21st to give thanks to pray about Ojimaka, about Mother Earth, given life. And in our ceremony, it says that uh, the Black Hills shapes like a heart. But today, from that satellite view, if we fast forward the four seasons, it's a heart that is pumping. Shapes like a heart. Shapes, you put a red fluorescent light on it. The mountains, the rivers, looks like an open heart. When you fast forward the four seasons, it's a heart that's pumping. The four seasons. And uh, we talked about uh, the tree of life. If you look at the map, if you look at the we call America, we call it North America. Uh, in our tradition, it's a Turtle Island. And from uh, the river, New Orleans, that's the base, it goes back to the big river, the big ocean. But if you look at towards the north, from that, New Orleans, you go up, looks like a, a tree that's laying there. All the rivers, the creeks, everything's all connected like that. And on, way on top, that one of the main streams that came, comes down, it's called Missouri River. And that's where we are with Standing Rock today and they're trying to lay this pipeline down. And it's gonna affect all the water. So, my grandmother and the elders talked about home birth. We, we are born into, the, we come from the star nation. And we were born here, we are born into the water of life. <clears throat> the Manu 
The Maniu Chwani goes way back to the first creation. The first medicine was Maniu Chwani, the water of life. It's very important to our life today because our body has the same amount of water as the earth mother. And when we were told about these prophecies, but someday these white animals will be born all over the world, that we're supposed to be the voice for all these white animals. And uh, they talked about, one of the elders talked about the um, black snake. The black snake uh, was the first one that was uh, the roads, the tar. The second was very dangerous. It's that black snake coming down from the north. And then the white snake is, uh, you know, it's the white camp trails. So there's a lot of things coming about together in our prophecies. So since 1994, almost every year, a white buffalo calf was born, a white animal was born all over the world. And that's the message that we carry since 1996. We traveled back to a place called Devil's Tower. To us, it's called Mount Hotipila. It's a very sacred place. It's like a church. It's a place of worship. And we want to change that name back to Mount Hotipila. But there's so much that uh, you know, is upon us today in this global world. So 1996, 1996, this statement, is we are at the crossroads. Either be faced with a lot of chaos, disasters, different types of viruses, sicknesses, tears from our relatives' eyes, or we can unite spiritually in this global community. All nations, all faiths, one prayer. Thank you. Time, why don't we open it up for some questions and comments and I'm gonna ask Orville maybe to come up here we do have a microphone over here so um, if your voice can't carry uh, let, let us know and we'll pass a microphone back yeah. <laughs> eat a lot of buffalo some tall huh? I want to have uh, Paula come up here then, because uh, she uh, is a coordinator of uh, World Peace and Prayer Day. Since uh, 20 years, we've been doing this um, all over the world and been to different countries. So she does all the work. No, I never uh, got on computer. I don't know nothing but computer because I stay in ceremony and does my work with uh, our ceremonies back home, and I, I am a fluent speaker. I do all the like um, all the things that has to do with uh, spirituality. You know, I've been involved like uh, right now, Standing Rock. But Paula's more into computer. <laughs> he likes Facebook, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, question. Hi, um, I have a question about what's going on right now in, in, at the front lines of the protest. Would it be possible for you guys to give us an update of like what work has been going on and what your plans are for the future for the protest? Well, I think that um, 
The most important thing that everybody needs to understand is that um, it was the young people that that stood up and they um, made that journey. There was a spiritual camp um, and prior to Cannonball with, was the uh, Keystone Pipeline. And so there was a lot of effort and preparation and um, I, they had training, you know, peaceful resistance. And so they kept preparing and kept preparing and then all of a sudden Obama, of course, stopped everything. And, um, but personally, I, I just, uh, I had a hard time with that because, and I don't know how everybody's feelings is about that, but when I was following and, you know, a lot of the women were the ones that, that stood up and organized. Um, and, uh, and of course they're personal friends of mine. Um, what I felt was when he stopped Keystone, my immediate question is, well, it doesn't make sense because he's still uh, pushing TPP, and it doesn't make sense. It 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 doesn't. <laughs> I don't care what anybody says. It's uh, worse than the pipeline, mm -hmm. and um, it takes away all our rights. Uh, it's eminent domain with the um, the other American land, but with our reservations it'll take away everything and I think that that's something that I personally always bring up but it's so big and it's so fine print and I I don't know has anybody ever completed everything of understanding what TPP is about in here it's so complicated but yet that's that fine print and it's bottom line is it's so much it's like a contract and you know uh, there's all this fine print that people can go to in other words, it takes away all your rights. And it's not just taking away rights of um, our, our own people, but it's taking away Mother Earth's rights to live. And we're looking out for the animal nations. And so when that happened, and I kept asking, and of course this next um, Dakota Access Pipeline, you know, with the Bakken Pipeline, um, the, that's gonna go all the way down through these territories, I think um, Bismarck, North Dakota, they were deciding whether or not um, to put it north of Bismarck, and um, the city didn't want it. But then they were okay that it went south. Um, and so everybody thinks this is just a Standing Rock's issue or the reservations issue, and I, I don't know if any, because we're the ones that are standing up, that they don't realize it's everyone's issue. Water travels, you know, it, it goes down the Missouri River into the Mississippi and goes into the Gulf of Mexico. We were just down in the Gulf of Mexico, I, I believe in May, and um, they were bidding out the floor of the Gulf of Mexico, and I think there was 80,000 acres, and so we stood into the Civic Center. We actually went down there for a water ceremony, and we kind of got pulled. We didn't even know it's not even in the media. And um, then when we realized what was going on, it was so hush, and there's a city of tourism, and eating all the shrimp and this this food that's contaminated. And, um, and it was this reality of it, and then they said, can you come to the Civic Center? They asked Orville, to come and pray, and then it was kind of like, like hit with a ton of bricks. It's like there's a bidding of the ocean floor, and already, you know, with um, the leak, all it is is a chemical release that's covering up the black, and so um, that from years ago, and nobody knows about that. It's um, it's still being contaminated, but it's just not oil. It's now a chemical to cover up the black and the, from the oil. And so now they're putting in um, all these other oil fields down there and, and I couldn't believe the people that were there, they were just, um, they were very reserved. They were, it was tunnel vision and they had, you know, they're ready to, uh, with the auctioneer and 
and they we were there right between them saying you know we don't want you to do this you know we, you stop this auctioning off and we were successful they only auctioned off um, 7,000 acres but they turned around and they put it on computer and now what I don't understand is that Obama just opened up bidding again so all of these I don't know um, who's running this country I don't know who's running this world, um, but to me it's, um, it's, it's a matter of conscious behavior that you young people are inheriting. And I think that it was, um, it, it was awesome to know that these young people ran to DC and, um, and I think that um, at first, when they had the ceremony, which Orville was involved with at Cannonball, um, it was the elders coming together. But you know, us older people, we have our baggage. Um, we've got all these things, our historical traumas, our, um, our issues, and it, we're still dealing with what has happened to our parents and our grandparents. And that stuff is, is something that is for us personally. And I know out in the American, you know, mainstream, you know, everybody has issues, okay? And, but the, what we're taught is, is only at face value. It's what affects us now. And so with our spiritual ways, of course, with or with the revival of our traditional ways and giving the freedom of religion in 1978, it was um, bringing about those teachings that we think seven generations to come. And so I, I actually am personally a product of, you know, being a born again Indian, so to speak, in the 70s and graduating from the first uh, native controlled true history of our people instead of what's taught in history books. So if any of you ever t were taught from history books, it's all, it's all a lie. And so um, now, of course, we're in, in these halls of educational facilities, institutions where we're telling the truth. And it's not for anybody to, um, I guess, feel guilty about. It's to bring a consciousness, to bring about uh, an awareness that, you know, it's a disease of the mind, even with our own people that we contracted that disease of the mind. And so as we go on with, what's going on with these young people, I think they, when they reached there and all their prayers, they went on a wing and a prayer and we reached Washington, that um, they had to be heard uh, by Creator. And so I think when, um, and what happened that day when the call went out was they found bones and it was actually of animal bones. Um, the, the burial mounds, they just, they just uh, doze, doze over is, is real. They're real burial mounds. But what happened was the, um, the Dakota Axis came upon these bones and they called the Thipo officer, uh, Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. And of course, he validated that it was, you know, animal bones. But when that happened, they got so scared and ran away. And when that happened, the tribal chairman was arrested. He was. He didn't know yet it was animal bones, and but it triggered this this um, something in the crowd, and and he he testifies that he don't he doesn't even know why, because um, he's the tribal chairman, you know, the tribal president, and he just stepped forward and he got arrested, and I don't think they knew who they were arresting actually, so when that happened, um, the word just was like um, it spread all over. And then now we have over 300 flags, and we it, it isn't 4,000, it's 7,000 people that came together. And um, and now it's, it's dwindling down, but every day people are coming in from all over. And the, day, the last day we were there, which was, was last week, um, the Sami people came. There were three women, and they brought their flag um, that crosses three countries, and they explained. and their culture, you know, and um, I always tell our people, these people live off the land, you know, I I dress like this, but I dress like you too. But these guys, they dress like that every day. And I say, hey, there's some white people out there that 
are even more traditional than us. They, they dress it every day and, and they live off the land and, and we've met them. And, um, and so I, I think that it's um, for us and our work that Orville explains for 21 years, we've been doing World Peace and Prayer Day and our work is to actually heal our umbilical cords because you know there's a lot of trauma within our recent years, but it also goes back further than that to you know the stories that Orville shared and each and every one of you you know you go back to um, nations that lived off the land that appreciated the earth and lived in harmony with the earth and certainly we all can't go back there but you know what there is so much jobs that can be created through sustainable development but because um, everybody is going after the oil they're hypnotized by it and in our old ways, it's yeah. to <coughs> it's the like, uh, man camp too. yeah. It it in our ways, it's uh, the oil, and um, this oil is is cre to me has an energy that's deep and dark. And for me, it comes you know from a, a very bad place, and it has nothing to do with um, good and evil. It's it's being hypnotized by the money that it creates. And you know what Orville just mentioned to me is the the man camps that come out of these places. Um, it's they they're never given jobs to local people. It's given to people that um, they bring in women. I know the one that's up by um, Fort Berthold, I believe it is. They found a, a child um, that was walking not far from a man camp. Um, that was sodomized, that was only two years old. And when a big windstorm came, it, uh, they found a 14-year-old boy, you know, that was missing, and he was getting passed around in these man camps. So these people are, you know, that they hire um, and bring in our reservations, you know, there's a lot of abuse, and there's a lot of missing and murdered women that nobody talks about. But as far as where we're at right now, uh, the chairman, our shamble, it's now just a stay again. There's no real decision. And it worries me because um, yesterday or the other day, one of Orville's relatives, we were talking to him, and there's a 20 mile buffer, but um, they're still digging, they're still preparing. And, and, and I just wish people would pay attention too to Iowa. You know, people, I don't know, does anybody know about Iowa in here? And they're mostly non-native people that are standing up against the Dakota Access. And so some of our people are trying to go help them. And I think there's an 85-year-old woman, year old woman that just got arrested. She's, you know, a couple weeks ago, a couple times, she keeps getting arrested. She likes to get arrested, I guess. <laughs> but but it hits the the news. Um, it does its work. So you know, I was wishing that you know more of the people they would get more attention and people would go help them down there because it's the same pipeline. It's just that our people, um, when they seen those kids and when they seen the chairman, they came. And so then uh, we've got 300 flags um, that's there down the main main place there. I, I don't even know how many anymore. It's, it's a lot, a lot of different organizations. Yeah. We have a ceremony for like our body, the blood, and then everything you put into your body, <clears throat> you have to pray with. But the blood, there's a ceremony to take care of that blood. There's a medicine, but sometimes we do a ceremony to, you know, uh, Take a little bit of blood out so it'll, your heart will pump uh, good blood. But the thing is, like, uh, we know that poison gets in your blood, then uh, that's it, your body dies. And Mother, Mother Earth, uh, that's what they're, it's fracking all across uh, Turtle Island, and it's probably fracking around here. And uh, it's a matter of time that it's uh, going into that water. And that's why we say that Mother Earth is sick and has a fever and she's dying. 
smell time and some of like this. Well, I think that's just a natural responsibility, a human responsibility. Um, I know that when you're in poverty, for us, what I see with our people is there's some hyster historical, hysterical trauma that has happened. And we're still coming out of that. And uh, it's those of us that have walk this traditional way and I mean Orville had to go his family had to go underground you know because um, our medicine people and spiritual leaders were beheaded they were put in institutions and we were told we were I mean why when Orville mentioned Devil's Tower it was like for instance uh, the Colonel um, Custer just happened and he was mad and um, it was it was an awareness that it was called you know, Bears Lodge by many people, but when um, he got angry and they said, well, it's a place of worship for these Indians, these Redskins, whatever they called us, and then he called it Devil's Tower. And this beautiful place to be called, you know, an evil, after an evil person, I, I don't get it, you know, but that's how I think the brainwashing begins, and it, it worked really well um, for me. I can only talk about me, but you know, my mother was taken away when she was five years old. I was raised by my grandmother. By the time you know I came, you know, into this world, but sh can you imagine any of you to have children to have your child taken away at five years old? So these these mothers, these parents, um, you know, went crazy, and these kids, when they came back, if they made it back. Um, they were totally brainwashed. So we're still coming out of that. We're still that whole historical trauma. But I have to give our people credit because um, statistically we're the fastest um, alcohol and drug-free recuperating people in the whole world because of our ways. Uh, he's Cheyenne what? River Sioux. Cheyenne River Sioux in South Dakota. Is he a policeman or not? He's a, he lives on the reservation, but just has issues with police on the red. I think every place that has policemen has <laughs> issues. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, again, that's historical trauma. And I think anybody that gets power. I mean, you ever get in a workplace where you get a boss that's like from hell? I mean, you know, because it goes to their heads. And then you've got really level-headed people that um, have their place in whatever workplace there is that um, realizes that the only way you can get along is to be, you know, to emit that, that good energy. But as, I mean, there, and, and then the other side of it for them, for the policemen, um, I think that uh, they're afraid for their lives. They go into places that um, where they don't know they're going to walk out of, um, and I think that's everywhere. And the other thing is, is um, I didn't realize until my friend got a job with uh, Devil's Tower, you know, Bear Lodge, that the veterans get first priority, 
and I have a lot of family members that are veterans, and um, you know my father's a veteran, but they have problems. They, you know, they really do. And so when they they get first priority, and they get first first priority to be a policeman. And today, I just think um, I've watched a couple things that happen, and they say they don't even know why they did what they did because they're trained. And there's got to be a deprogramming, and that's why with our people, we have the Red Feather Society, where we bring him back and we take him through a ceremony because when you, you're in combat and you take lives, that spirit stays with you, you know, and it's always around you. And so we have a ceremony that helps them to get rid of those, and, and they kind of meet each other in that spiritual plane and let them go so no, they're not angry. So if something, they have a PTSD moment when they arrest somebody and, and they're not killing people. So I think just there's both sides to the story and I, I can't really answer that plainly. Um, but yeah, I, some policemen can be real nice and some pe policemen can be real mean, you know. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, yes. And that, um, uh, like, people from the, say, the Jim from the Gun Boys, you call it, what kind of Yeah, support, my niece did, yeah. What kind of support do you get? Do you give, like, spiritual guidance, or do you, like, what kind of, like, how do you intervene with um, the non-Native community in other places? Well, they're with us, too, up at, up at uh, Standing Rock. There, there's a lot of non-Natives that have come in, you know, actors, actresses, um, all colors, all countries, you know, have come. Um, I just feel bad I, for them down in Iowa, and I think they're about complete down there. The, they've laid the pipeline. So how, for me, it's like, how can you spend so much money? And see, you got to understand that the political people that are in those positions in North Dakota, the governor, <clears throat> the, the sheriff, the senators, the congressmen, they're, they all have stock. You know, it's like we're going up against the mountain. And so um, I don't know how this is going to turn out. And all we can do is pray, and that's why um, they have him come in and, and the elders, and, and um, they're like, if you have thousands of people together, there's, you know, some, um, some of the society ill wills come in, and so we've had to deal with, like, another city and organizing and... Um, historical drama that I just mentioned. Um, but overall, um, I have to give our people credit that they're determined because um, if this gets laid down, and, and I want to tell you something about this place too. Um, a few days ago, I have a friend that I go and spend time with and uh, a few times up in St. Uh, James Smith, is that James Smith Reserve? Is that in Saskatchewan? Is that? And um, she's an elder, and she's somebody that grew up in the bush. She never went to um, boarding school. She's real, raised, you know, 11 kids, and they're all dancers and, you know, going to school. And I told her, because every time I went to visit her, she made me rabbit stew. And I was saying, oh, I haven't heard from you. We teased each other. I don't know if you have friends like that. <laughs> Because we tease each other. I don't know if you have 
friends like that where you're so close, you tease each other. And, and um, so I did that with it. And to her, can you hear me? Okay. I did that to her, and she goes, oh, didn't you hear? And I go, uh, no, because where she lives, it's so beautiful. There's trees, you get a ways way out in the country, and then there's this house, and then it overlooks this, this river that's way down there, and it's just like this cliff, and the kids, you know, go down there, and they, they fish, and while I was there, I eat all this, you know, delicious food she cooks, and so I said, um, you know, I was asking her if they're going to go hunting and her, all her kids do that. And she goes, oh, no, um, up by North Battleford, the Husky Oil had a leak. And, it, and um, I said, really, when? And she said, in um, July. And she said, now this whole river is contaminated. And, you know, the, the white people, they're down by the, um, right down the corner here. And they're... They have their boats going day and night, day and night, day and night, but you know, in all honesty, they're not gonna clean it up. And she said, the fish, they're gray inside, and they're finding dead um, jumpers, which are deer, and moose, and elk, and um, game all over. And she says, and um, so I can't make you rabbit stew anymore. And that just like broke my heart, you know, because um, she grew up in the bush, and. She lived in harmony with the earth. You know, she doesn't live close to a city. She didn't hurt anybody, but then it brought me to a place of, you know, the tar sands. And does anybody know about the tar sands in here? And so the tar sands is, is a place where uh, the Lubicon Territory and the uh, Fort McDermott, half their, or over half their people are dead from the uh, chemicals that are, they use to separate the oil from the sand. And so there, it's called bitumen oil. And so that's, have you heard of the spill in Kalamazoo River? Anybody? Okay, that's bitumen oil. And those people, you don't hear that. It's a, well, how come we don't hear that? All these people had to move. And all that, all that life in the water and in the land down there is completely dead. It's dead zone. And so, um, and it, it just brought me to that place. And then we've got Fukushima going on, and the Gulf, and the fracking. And um, you young people, you need to stand up. So pay attention. It's time maybe for one more question. Um, <clears throat> yes. Yes, you. <laughs> I think now I've seen some really good um, things come out of now. I, you could probably Google that. Um, there, if you blog Standing Rock Camp or Sacred Stone Camp, um, right now say, there are four camps. The one that's by the river, the, the first one that's Sacred Stone, they are They've, they're getting ready for winter. There's a lot of non-natives there, and they're with different peace groups, or environmental groups, environmentalists. And then there's Ocheti Shakoi camp, that's the seven council fires. And um, then there's the Red Warrior camp. And, um, and they're from Oglala mostly, and they are, they're, uh, they're real warriors, I guess. And, um, and then there's a Rosebud camp, which is from a reservation. And so right now, there's so much legal stuff going on, and I think that that's the war that the Dakota Access Pipeline is going to rage war on with the tribal government there. And that's with stannyrock.org. And there's a lot of um, information, true information, coming out of that one. So if you could go to that, uh, pay attention to that mostly because that's from the chairman. And that's where you'll find out recent news 
what's going on. Um, as far as media, um, gosh, what was his name? Lawrence? That's what you should have showed, that Lawrence one, by the way. Uh, it was, uh, <laughs> I, I, she was trying to ask me, what should we show? Should, and we were Democracy like, now. Democracy Now? Is that yep. Lawrence? Yep. Yeah, okay. So he did a really good presentation. You, you've got to look, but you know, that, that I think, um, and then I seen some that CNN did, but it's slanted. It's like, but it's gonna create a lot of jobs. And um, you know, and the benefits is is only fourteen hundred people. But when the pipeline breaks, which they all do eventually, in our children's lifetime, maybe not ours, but in our children's lifetime, when it does, it's it's there's no money that can ever repair. As you know, I, the story I just told you, the Husky Oil is told that they need to clean that up, and how can they? You know, how can they clean that up? There's nowhere to go. And it's not just reservations. It's, like I said, Kalamazoo. And we were just talking to Karina Gore last night. She came to our speaking. And um, she's working. It's, it's all the same thing. And Ridge, now they're changing their name. And it's out this way, too. You know, in this area, you guys got to stand up. You got to pay attention. You know that they're they're all over, and yeah, we all put you. We have a car too, and we flew here, but there are ways sustainable development that all this money and uh, can be brought into our communities and create new jobs and create new ways of transportation. They exist, but they make it so expensive, and you know, so that we're dependent on oil, and that's not fair.